Hi, everybody, and welcome to another Robcast. We are actually on location, and we have an audience of three. So um, I'm here with Martin Gore. Welcome, Martin. Thank you. Hello, Rob. Good to be here. This is so fantastic. You've done so many things in your life, but this is your first time on the Robcast. <laughs> first time on the Robcast, and maybe could be my first time on a podcast. Is it really? I can't remember doing an uh, actual podcast where I sat and spoke. Oh, this is just... Well, you sat and spoke? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you open have music podcasts. You know, I've put music together for podcasts before. Yes. But now you're actually on one. This yes. is a big moment. Big moment. And then, um, obviously, Kristen Bell is here. And neighbor Susan. We'll call you neighbor Susan and Kara Lee. So, we... Um, lovely ladies on the couch. We're in... This is your studio. It is, yes. And you come here each day and you make this glorious noise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I come here each day. Um, I do something in here every day, whether it's actually, you know, create a track or make a sound or just fiddle around with a piece of equipment. Do you ever, do you ever walk out at the end of the afternoon and just like, I didn't do one interesting thing today? Yeah, that happens. Of course it does. And do you ever walk out thinking, the thing that I made today, that's pretty good? <laughs> I think I always feel good if I manage to get some kind of an idea of a song down. Yeah. That, you know, it changes your whole mood. I don't know if you talked about Kerry Lee on the couch there. was my, my wife, Kerry Lee. I don't know if she notices the days where I walk out and I think I didn't do one thing in there today or the, and, and the difference between those days and the days when I yeah. finished a song yeah but, but I am definitely different <laughs> no really she's <laughs> nodding her head vigorously you can tell when he wrote something he likes yes, absolutely. you can tell isn't that fascinating I also find it interesting everybody I know who's doing work that brings them joy has days when they're like yeah, I didn't really make much today. But in order to make other stuff, you have... Somehow that's part of the bargain or the deal. Yes. Um, I mean, I don't think that anyone can ever expect to be able to be creative on a daily basis. You know, there, yeah. there are going to be times when, you're, when something just magical just happens and times where, you know, you're just at a complete loss. Ex I was writing a book. It took me 18 months every day, all day to write this book. And it got so hard at different times. I would work for like a week on a paragraph or I'd work for a whole day on a sentence and at the end of the day, delete that sentence. <laughs> yes. And I remember the only thing that got me through is the only way to make this is to keep, it's like a search for all the stuff that doesn't belong in this book. <laughs> and by the end of this process, somehow I will have deleted enough stuff, there'll be something left, which is sort of the opposite of it. Um, so let's go way back. What are your first music? When did you first find yourself making music or enjoying music or under, or appreciating it? The f first um, experience I had with music was discovering rock and roll. And I was about 10 years old and I found it was a plastic bag full of records in my mother's cupboard. And we had a record player at home. <laughs> So I was just fascinated by the technology, the, you know, the fact you could just put this thing on, the arm came across, and, um, but the, just the sound that, that came out of the, the, the speakers. And I didn't understand what it was at the time, what, what attracted me to it. Um, I think it was definitely something mysterious. But you know, I would even go as far as to say that, there were, that I didn't understand sexuality at the time or, or, you know, obviously because I was 10. But there was, <laughs> but, you know, yeah. listening to rock and roll yeah. records, there was something in there that maybe I didn't understand, but that I, that I wanted to understand. Yeah, it's, it's like it strikes some chord in you that you don't have language for or even comprehension of, but it's real. Yes. And it's sort of vibrating there. Did you, what were some of the records? Elvis was uh, uh, um, uh, on a lot of those records, yeah. you know, so there was quite a few Elvis singles. It was mainly singles. Um, was she not playing them? Why were they in a plastic bag? Yeah, no, mum, oh, I've, I've got another story to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> because obviously I loved these records and I played them to death. And I think when I was about 15, um, 
I came home one day, and maybe I was older, maybe I was more like 18, 19, and the, you know, I was doing stuff with the band, and I came home and wanted to listen to these, these old rock and roll records because I hadn't heard them for a while. And I went looking for them, and I said, Mum, where, where, where are those records? Where are your records, your old, your old rock and roll stuff? She said, oh, I threw them away, they were old. <laughs> she didn't know that you'd been listening to them? Oh, yeah, but, you know, maybe I hadn't listened to them for a couple of years or so because, I'd, you know, by, by that time yeah. I'd got my own jobs and, yeah. you know, uh, made a pittance but spent <laughs> every single penny that I made on buying records. And did you, when did you start playing music or creating music? I had a friend who played guitar and he taught me a couple of chords when I was about 13. And I think he also taught me how to like read a, like, you know, the, the guitar tabs. Yeah. So I bought a guitar tab book and, you know, <laughs> just taught myself yeah. the rest of the chords. And then there, there was this uh, little kind of like paper magazine that came out. And I think it was weekly or maybe it could have been monthly, but I think it was weekly. And it was called Disco 45. And it had all of the, the chart songs, all of the words for all of the chart songs in it. And I used to just sit in my bedroom and like, work out how to play this, the songs. You know, obviously, there were some that I couldn't because they were too complicated. But, um, but I, I used to spend years doing that. And I think that was one of the greatest uh, things I ever did for myself because, you know, just just sitting there and working out the chords to songs and how the chord structures go. You know, you go from a chorus to a bridge, uh, sorry, verse to a bridge to a chorus yeah. and, and doing that over and over and over again. It, it yeah. was probably a great training for songwriting. Yes. And the first moment when you realize there's a one, four or five in a relative minor and you realize almost everything stays within that. Oh my word. There's like, there's like a math underneath this or something. Um, fascinating how many people say that oh, I spent 10 years in my bedroom <laughs> with the guitar. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Like, right. a, like I built the 10,000 hours up or whatever. Yeah. No, I did. I mean, I never became a great guitar player, but I think it was, you know, more uh, songwriting. Oh, wait, I, I'm not going to let him get away with that. <laughs> I never became a good guitar player. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. It's a friendly podcast, but I can, like, push back on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I... I <laughs> I don't. I don't think I ever. You know, I never wanted to learn guitar solos. Right. You know, right. I, I never wanted to like you know be a guitar hero. That right. I, I, it's something that never crossed my mind. The guitar served some larger thing called the song. Yes. As opposed to wee 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 wee. <laughs> yeah, look at Yes. Me. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, for the majority of those years, I played a, a, a like a nylon acoustic you know, in my bedroom. So, you know, the the wailing guitar solos didn't really work on it anyway. That's funny. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, I remember my college roommate, Ian Eskelin, who will be so excited that we are talking. <laughs> I remember him saying one time to me, like 1990, he's like, the thing about Depeche Mode songs is you can play them on a guitar. And he was always like, I bet underneath it all somewhere, there's like an old battered acoustic that Martin Gore has. <laughs> like he, he used to, he used to, like you do when you're in college and you're listening to your favorite albums, but he always used to have this theory. He's like, that's why they're so great is because you can strip down all the various layers and somewhere under there, the song works with just a guitar. Well, I used to um, always write on a guitar or a piano or something or a keyboard um, just to get the, the chord structure, the words... Um, and I felt that if the song's working in that context, yes. then it's going to work when you, you know, put it to a, a beat and, a you know, you get electronics involved and yeah. I, I keep saying, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, um, dig my, dig a hole for myself here. Cause I used to say this all the time <laughs> <laughs> and I used to say that, um, that if you start on electronics, you can fool yourself into thinking that what you're working on is better than it is uh, because you yeah. might get carried away with an amazing sound you've created, but you've kind of disregarded working on the words or the, mm -hmm. or the, or the chords. But as time went on, I, I just think for inspiration, I still sometimes write songs on guitar and piano, 
but sometimes these days I do actually start with you know like I might get a, a loop going on the modular system with like some drums and a bass line and that might start me off with the idea for a song yeah so you're 13 14 15 you're playing guitar you're playing guitar when do you start playing when does like let's form a band come into it well I had a friend um, who had a synthesizer and he lent it to me <laughs> for uh, a two-week period. And I just really enjoyed it. I, you know, I was a big fan of uh, you know, craft work at the time. And there was a burgeoning electronic scene. And there was bands like the, the Human League, whose early stuff I really liked. It was you know, much more experimental than the, the, uh, the, the Human League stuff that is popular in America, which kind of was more like the dare you know, don't you want me stuff? Yeah. Yeah, but their first couple of albums were, you know, quite experimental. And then they had an EP out before that called The Dignity of Labour, which I really liked. Um, but anyway, there was a burgeoning electronic scene. So after this two-week rental of the synthesizer, I decided to go and buy one. And it just so happened that Vince and Andy had just formed... Uh, a band and Nor Norman no that was my band oh, we, okay. we, 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 we weren't we weren't electronic <laughs> <laughs> um, no so they were called at the time No Romance in China <laughs> oh <laughs> that we, that like mid what's this mid 70s this, this must have been like 1980 I think 80 no yeah, romance not, in China it could have been late, late 1979 early 1980 that's like the best 80s band name ever <laughs> No romance in China. <laughs> Can that even fit on a poster? <laughs> that is fantastic. So at the time, it was just Vince and Andy. Yep. And they hadn't played any shows as far as I know. Um, but I think they got wind that I was going to go and buy a cheap synthesizer. So that was it. I was in the band. I think they came with me. <laughs> they, came, they, they came on the train with me to London, uh, you know, to, to actually go to a music store. And and I bought my first synthesizer, which was a, a Yamaha CS5, and like a very small, uh, cheap monophonic thing. Yeah, yeah. I love how many band stories are. Well, so and so had equipment, so they're in. <laughs> like you have a drum set, so you're in. Yeah. So <laughs> you're you're playing, and that where? So where does Depeche Mode come in this? You played for a while with them, Vince Clark, so Andy Fletcher. Yes. And you're playing with them. Yes. And Does it get ahead of steam? Are you any good? Do you yeah. have like grand dreams or are you just like, this is how we meet girls? Like where, <laughs> what does it mean to you at that point? Um, I didn't take it very seriously. I don't, I, I think that Vince was very, very driven at a very oh, young age. interesting. And, you know, I'll give him a lot of credit for that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, at, at the time we're talking about, this was before we'd even met Dave. Mm -hmm. um, so the first thing that happened after that was they were so impressed uh, by my synthesizer. <laughs> that and it was called a synthesizer. Yeah, yeah it was a synthesizer, yeah. <laughs> that, that they decided to also uh, buy cheap monophonic synthesizers and we were going to become an all-electronic band. So we did. And were your were other kids and bands at that time doing this? There were, in England there was like I said this scene that was yeah. happening, but it it was still quite, you know, there was no we didn't know anyone in our town that was doing it. You know, there was it was quite rare still. Yeah. But, Amazing. Um, so but somehow you're like let's do it this way. So you did it that way. Yeah, and, and well, the only other person was my friend, whose name was uh, real name was Rob Allen, but he went by the name Rob Marlow. <laughs> uh, he he was the one who lent me the the synthesizer. He did have a he did have a, a, a band, but I was in his band as well. So so you know that was that's why he had a kind of a, a, an electronic band because <laughs> you know I was in the two bands. And are you, were you playing? You're playing clubs. You're playing so. So we had a really bad name when when I joined Andy and Vince. Uh, I'll give Vince credit for this as well. <laughs> <laughs> he came up with the name uh, Composition of Sound. 
Oh, which, second which is best awful. 80s. No, that's awful. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, especially when we, it, it was abbreviated to COS, <laughs> which I believe is lettuce. <laughs> <laughs> Composition of sound. Yes. Oh, so just awkward and great at the same time. <laughs> So, so we so we used to rehearse once a week at a, a youth, uh, um, you know, like a, a youth center. That's what they're mm-hmm. called. And um, Dave came along for some reason to one of our rehearsal sessions, and um, I think Vince must have asked him, you know, are you interested in in joining a band? And we did a, an impromptu. Um, audition and he actually sang uh, Heroes by David Bowie mm-hmm. and good choice yeah I don't know how we played it because we de- definitely didn't have that kind of musical expertise at that point but we somehow must have muddled through it <laughs> <laughs> and could he sing then yeah he could yeah were you like how old was he 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 was he's always he's, well he still is he always, he always has been a year younger than us so I think we were I think Vince was 20. I was like 19. So Dave was probably 18. And you were like, that guy can sing. Mm-hmm. And did something, like if it was a movie, was there a magical moment when you guys were like, we got what it takes. We can go all the way. Or was it just, oh, wow, that's an interesting. Maybe we could do something else. No, I still, at that stage, it was still um, just thinking about Oh well, now we've got four members. We're kind of a band. Maybe we should get some gigs. <laughs> it was. It was. So this because sometimes at that age people are like, "Oh, this is what I'm. This is what we're born to do. We're going to go to the top." But you, it wasn't that. Well, you're British, <laughs> so there was there's a bit more. Eddie Izzard has this great line about a British kid. Like, I want to go to the moon. You're British, kid. Uh, I want to sell shoes. That's more like it. <laughs> yeah. He has this whole bit about... <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, well, Vince was quite driven, as I said. Yeah, so... so, so he, He's pushing. So once we started playing a few gigs and we, we started getting a, a small local following, um, he, I, th- I think we then went into a recording studio and we, we, we maybe recorded like three or four songs. And then Vince and Dave would go up to London and set up meetings with record companies and get, uh, you know, uh, sent out the door with their tails <laughs> between their legs. <laughs> and uh, But, you know, they kept at it for a while, but it, that didn't really get us anywhere. So. And are you working just a regular job? Are you in school? What are you doing when you're not doing composition... The composition of sound. Oh yeah, no. So, so the moment Dave joined the band, we did change our name to Depeche Mode. Ah, so got it. so I'm not sure if we actually ever played any any actual gigs. I'm sure maybe one or something under under the name Composition of Sound. <laughs> if I say we never did, someone's going to tell me that yes, yes, you did. And I'm I've not, got a bootleg. Yeah, on. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and did you? Um, and you were writing. Vince was writing a lot of the material. Vince was writing. Um, pretty much all the material at the, in the very beginning and then you make the first album yeah so I, I did write two songs on the first two. album then after the first album he leaves and you start writing yeah the weird taking over the major load of writing the, the weird thing about it was he told us he was leaving before the first album was even released um and was that panic or was that oh we're gonna be fine I think it was the uh, the 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 wonder and the naivety of youth meant that we didn't panic at all. Um, you know, we you know we we'd found a, a kind of mentor. We have you know, we're still really good friends with this guy called Daniel Miller, who was the head of Mute Records, and he was one of the you know leaders in the independent label scene so he he owned this this independent label called mute and we met him in 1980 when we supported one of his artists called fad gadget fad gadget fad fad gadget (laughs) that's just fun to say (laughs) fad gadget yeah unbelievable (laughs) so yeah we supported fad gadget at this pub in london called the bridge house which was you know a little bit of an institution as 
far as pubs go. I mean, mm-hmm. it only held probably like 150 people. But we, we'd played there on our own before, and, and in the beginning, we only had like 10, 15 people turn up. But we the, the night we played with Fad Gadget, obviously, he had a big following, so it was a, you know, it was a, there, there was an atmosphere. And Daniel saw us play and came backstage after and said, do you want to do a one-off single deal? So, of wow. course, we said yes. Yeah. I mean, not only was that amazing that someone had come backstage and offered us a, offered us a one-off single deal, it was Daniel Miller and it was Mute Records, and he was one of the only, he was probably the only all electronic label in England at the time, and we were big fans of you know things like DAF that Deutsche Amerikanische Freundschaft that he'd put out, and he had his own thing called the Normal, who did the original of Warm Leatherette. And so you had sort of admired this and looked up to this whole scene in him and the work he was putting out, and then he wants to make something with you. Yeah, and it was just uh, a one-off single deal. And I can uh, I don't know if I've ever really spoken about this, but there are some other funny things. You know what Doctor Who is? Mm-hmm. So um, we got a residency in a place called Crocs, um, which is in a place called Rayleigh, just outside of uh, Basildon, where we grew up. And we met this one guy there who had an idea that he, that he wanted to take us to Africa and play kind of like Doctor Who covers or something. <laughs> it, oh, no, Doctor, it was Doctor Who outfits. That was it. Doctor Who outfits. I don't know how he thought, but, but, you know, but when you're young, it sounded like, well, maybe there's something in this. You know, maybe he's got a vision. <laughs> So thank God, <laughs> thank God Daniel came along when he did. <laughs> we, we could have been in Doctor Who outfits in Africa. I mean, I don't know, I don't know what, you know, what appeal there would have been for an African seeing a, an English band in Doctor <laughs> Who outfits playing electronic music. <laughs> but that story is so awesome on so many levels, but so many people, when they see somebody doing something and it's gone well and they've reached an audience or they've thrived or whatever... There's like this, well, you just must have started out. It must have been great. And you must have, but you were like one turn or conversation away from Africa and Doctor Who. <laughs> like it could have gone some other way, but it didn't. I just find the whole, that's just a great mystery. Well, the other, the other mystery is that um, we actually went with Mute Records, even though we loved them as a label and they had all of the aesthetics that we loved, you know, the electronic uh side of yeah. it there was the independent side of it which meant that they you know weren't part of any uh, you know big label um but of course they had no money yeah. so so they weren't offering us anything yeah and at the same time we were being courted by you know big big labels like at the time there was polydor and uh, i can't remember the names of some of the others that were that were chasing us but we had two or three of them that were were after us and they were offering us, like, you know, at the time, you know, $100,000, 150000 sorry, pounds. And Which must have been crazy money. That was, for us at that point, yeah. that was crazy money. Crazy. And we said, no, we are going with Daniel. Because we trusted him. Yeah. And I think that that, that was uh, a, a miraculous choice because... Um, like Wham, for instance, got signed by the, the, I think it was the same guy who was chasing us, and I think it was Polydor. And, you know, the, I think they ended up getting completely ripped off, didn't make a penny yeah, for the first, like, you know, I don't know how many years. Man, it's fascinating to me how many people early on had these moments where they either went with integrity and what they, their heart or large money somewhere in there there was like defining moments where they they went with soul and integrity and aesthetics that lined up with what they wanted to do over big money and then later were like that was the right thing cuz oftentimes it's like oh it's of course you can make those decisions look at how well you've done and i'm always like no i guarantee you they probably started you know what i mean making that decision every time yeah we you know we came from very working class backgrounds it's that, that it wasn't like you know we just had so much money that we could easily make that right, decision right right um you know it, uh, 
I worked in a, a, a bank in a clearing house until our, uh, our second single, just about just before our second single was released. That's when I left and um, decided to take it seriously. I, I decided to take it seriously when the first single got to like number 50 or something, <laughs> in the, 50 something in the British charts. Because, yeah. because we literally hadn't done anything to get it to number 50. You know, we, ha we hadn't taken it that seriously. So we, we started thinking if we take this seriously and actually put a bit of effort into this, maybe we can make something of it. <laughs> that is so great. Okay, was there a day at the bank that you had your last day at the bank and they were like, well, what are you going to do? And you're like, I've got a synthesizer. <laughs> I mean, was there a day? There must have been some day when it was, you were done at the bank. Um, that must have been I, a huge I, moment. I had to give my notice, yes. And I remember my manager saying to me, you're making a big decision, yes. a, big, a, big, a big mistake. I was just going to ask, was there a manager who said, do you understand the mistake that you're making? Yeah. Because there's always a manager saying, <laughs> do you understand the mistake that you're making? Yeah. And I, yeah, no, there was. And, um, you know, I think I realized um, before that when they sent me off on a, uh, you know, some kind of like course that was to further my career in banking. And I had to study like accountancy and law. <laughs> and I think I was supposed to do the course for six months or so. And I think I survived about two months. And I went to my manager and I said, I just can't do this. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, that is so good. So <laughs> then the band takes off. Then album, album. Um, when did you realize, oh, wow, these songs strike a chord with people? That you could make something and then you'd share it with, with and it would do something in people. I think that... Uh, that took a while because, you know, the first album, for instance, was very different because it was, you know, n nine of the 11 songs were written by Vince. Yeah. And I think he's, you know, we, we just write in completely different ways. Yeah. And even with the second album, I mean, I didn't really know what I was doing. I was still only like 20, I think. And, you know, I did feel like I'd been, you know, thrown in the deep end. Right. So, you know, it's it's a, a real mishmash and it's the, there's no real direction and it's right. like you know kind of pop and you know there's like little hints of like something that we might a direction that we might be going in in the future but there's it's i don't think there's anything on there that would that made people like turn their heads and go wow they're doing something really different yeah, um, apart from you know the, 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 the electronic aspect yeah yeah because there are some people who who love the the fact that we were still going down that electronic route and um, you know, very early on, you know, there are some people like from the like the Detroit, Detroit uh, techno scene who say they were very influenced by the, our early stuff. Yeah, um, I just can't get enough. Just can't get enough was first album. Yes. Okay, so and that's Vince. Yes. So we go from just when I'm with you, baby. Within a couple of albums, Black Celebration, People Are People, those are those are very different. I mean, there's a depth in a, um, in only a few albums, the what you're singing about and writing about shifts. Um, I mean, that's a long way from when I'm with you, baby. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Did you, con what were your influences? I mean, I, and I know for many people, Depeche Mode was singing about the big stuff when lots of people were like, hey, hey, baby. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I think that, um, you know, meeting Daniel was a mm -hmm. was a big turning point in our lives, and then I would say that another big turning point in our lives was um, meeting an engineer called Gareth Jones, who was living in Berlin at the time. Um, suggested that we go to Berlin to record an album, um, and you know he was uh, vegetarian. He was worldly. He was older than us, you know. Yeah. And uh, you know, I just think that that just helped to you know, for me personally. I think I was very inspired by being around Gareth and being around Daniel and recording in Berlin. I mean, we, we went to uh, Hansa Studios, Which is where David Bowie went, where, and then where, where you two went later, yeah, where where Bowie and yeah Iggy, yeah. Iggy recorded. 
and you know they obviously they were our heroes so you know it was um you know, we couldn't believe that we were there um but you know i just think it was the right time as well because we were um you know maturing we were just we were all getting older yeah and we were getting to travel the world i mean 1982 we did our first tour where we actually traveled to um asia and you know got to witness you know asia as as a 20 year old or whatever right. 21 year old and you know i think that had a big influence on the writing for construction time again which was a more more kind of like outward looking album not not an album of love songs because you're you're good british kids who work in banks <laughs> right and you're night you have tea with your mom or whatever and then all of a sudden you're in berlin and then you're in asia <laughs> i have to believe that you you must have just your head must have been spinning at certain moments like we are a long way from the village <laughs> you know what i mean yes from my bedroom with a guitar and the cultural and the raising of consciousness let alone a vegetarian engineer who's i mean like those are all the th at a young age those have a huge impact did you ever just think how did we you must have had like a conversation going among yourselves uh, uh, everything did happen quite quickly um for us because i remember you know when we first went up to london when we were you know 20 uh, sorry 19 or whatever when we were recording the first album i think daniel suggested let's get an indian <laughs> and, we, and we all looked at each other and we were like, Indian, what's that? <laughs> Curry, know, what are you talking we were, about? It, we, we, we came from <laughs> Basildon, which is like, you know, was it, at that time, it's, it, uh, you know, there were very few um, restaurants in that town. It's, it's like, there, I think there was one Chinese takeaway or something. Or, and I, th I think you could sit down because <laughs> once we tried to go in and sit down, they wouldn't let us because we looked too weird. <laughs> <laughs> I just find it like... There's all sorts of theories about why people grow, but generally, the uh, we are handed something in life that we don't. Our current categories and labels don't have any f way to make sense of, and so when confronted with something new, whether it's pain, loss, suffering, some cross-cultural interaction, we either it breaks us because we, and that's what allows you to move forward into greater enlightenment, consciousness, expansion growth, maturity, spirituality, etc. We either are willing to go through that pain of, I'm a long way from where I grew up, and we move into greater maturity and growth and expansion, or we dig in our heels and resist it, fight it, and become even more entrenched. But for some reason, what I always find the great mystery is for some reason at each stage for you all, you just kept going. So Berlin, Asia... Yeah, well, um, when Gareth suggested Berlin to record, you know, part of construction time again, we jumped at it and we loved the experience. And yeah. within uh, two years of that, I was living there. Oh, were you really? So, yeah, I moved from Basildon. To know, Berlin? To Berlin. <laughs> Unbelievable. How long did you live in Berlin? Uh, two years. Incredible. And did you go, and, and was your family back in Basildon, like, were they, could they come with you in a sense? Not like move there, but did they understand what was happening and this is great? Or were they just like, you know, send cards? Um, <laughs> yeah, no one ever came over to Berlin when I was there to visit. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but I know, I think they understood that, that um, you yeah, know, the band was doing well by that stage. Yeah. So it wasn't, you know, if the band had been doing horribly, they may have been saying to me, what yeah. are you doing? What, what are you doing, son? You know? Right, right, right. <laughs> And so, another album, another album, another album, and then your, like, arenas, stadiums, videos, it gets really... When does it get crazy? Is it just one slow, gradual, or were there moments where you looked at each other like, oh, this is, like, the next level? I think we were very fortunate that things were very gradual with us. Mm -hmm. So, with the first album, it was successful in England, and it did kind of okay in Europe, but, you know, Just Can't Get Enough was kind of a very underground hit, yeah. maybe in clubs in America, but, you know, nothing really. It didn't make that many inroads. Um, so, you know, maybe by the second or third album, we, you know, we'd, we'd, we had started to do a bit better in Europe. 
um, but we, we kind of had written America off. We, we just felt that we were too European for America. Yeah, and for a British band, America is just massive, wide, vast. So at what point did, did you have some moment like, let's try America? Well, yeah, we, we almost gave up. I think in like 19, I think we played in 1983 and you know, we were playing small theatres and the, the attendance was kind of okay, but not amazing. And every interview we went into was kind of like justifying ourselves as a band because we were electronic and we weren't, you know, rock, <laughs> you know. So, um, you know, we, we almost gave up. And then I don't know why somebody talked us into coming back in 1985, I think it was. We, we came back. Depeche Mode almost gave up. <laughs> no, in America. Oh, in America. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but just this is a hard slog. Yeah. Yeah. It just it just seemed like we, it, we were just like yeah hitting our heads against the wall every time we came to America, and then we came back in 1985, and the whole alternative radio thing had happened. Yes. And we just couldn't believe it. You know, we were we were playing sheds, and there were like fifteen thousand people <laughs> there every night, and it was you know incredible absolutely incredible and then uh the rose bowl the 101 album is 90 89 90 i, th I think 80? we actually played in i think it was 80 i think it was 87 88 that I so within f whatever five years four years you're you're playing to you know that's just unbelievable now did you um so they're like fans i'm assuming you're having like super fans outside the hotel there's travel money people coming at you wanting to be on the inner circle did it must did you have how did you personally cope or how did you did you have somebody like okay this is how you manage this level or or were you just sort of figuring it out i mean a lot yeah, of people I, their their own sort of sanity goes out the window at some point because this is just i mean we've seen that happen so often yeah, no, I think our, our sanity did go out of the window. Mm. And, you know, we we did what I think any, like, well, most young people in our situation would do. You know, we ended up, like, partying. That became, like, part of our, you know, yeah. that was part of our MO. Every, you know, the shows were kind of, like, you know, very secondary back then. It was like, let's get to the party. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> it was like, let's play a show and then let's, you know... Let's party. What? Yeah. Fascinating. And um, did the wheels come off at some point? Yes. Um, so in 1990, well, before then, really, because uh, I was going to say the 1993, 94 tour that we did for Songs of Faith and Devotion was, um, it was an 18 month tour. Wow. And, you know, we, we went all over the world. And there were there were times when, you know, you, we were in Singapore and we'd been on tour for, I don't know, 14 months. And, you know, you, you start having these thoughts, why are we in Singapore? We don't even sell any records here. <laughs> you know? Yes. You yeah. Know, I'm just going to get drunk again. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, yeah, it's yeah. Like, you know, it's, um, you know, I, 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 we all managed to get through that tour without dying, but just about, I think. Yeah. Fascinating. Now, um, from early on, um, there's this like sp spirituality, sexuality. You're not always writing about what other bands are writing about. Um, there's a depth. There's a profundity. There's this. Um, I mean, when I pick up, there's a, there's a familiar with the sacred, um, but it's not the sacred necessarily of cathedrals. It's the sacred in flesh and blood and skin and bone. And where did that? Were you, what were you reading? What were your um, I mean, the spiritual themes that are running through this, it's techno music, it's, it's computer music, it's, we can dance to it, but it's also speaking to the soul. Where did that, did you have a model for that, or were you just, this is what these songs should be about? I didn't um, I have... that was a long question. <laughs> <laughs> I just kept going. <laughs> You know, there wasn't a, a model to, you know, like a, a template that I you had. You know, sometimes people are are inspired by somebody who are like, I want to do that, but... No, I think I've always been interested in uh, spirituality and religions even. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, I've never uh, followed a religion. Um, you know, sometimes I envy people who do because I feel that they they have something that I never quite get to. Like a grounding or a yes. path, yeah. Um, so, you know, I was quite familiar with, with you know, the Bible and, and you know, I, got, I looked in, you know, I used to read other religions' yeah. books and, um, and I found that quite... Um, you know, motivating when it came to writing songs. I think it's always a, a, a good topic. Yes. And especially if you can then um, kind of turn that into, like you say, more of a, a flesh and bone thing. Yeah. And, and you know, twist it slightly. And yes. I, I, I always quite liked, you know, the idea of uh, being in a pop group, but being able to be as subversive as I wanted. I quite like that. You know, there was there was there's something nice about you know you know oh they're just a pop group, but you know right. <laughs> oh, I love to hear you say that because that's what everybody's sort of reading the liner notes of your albums is like this guy's do- he he knows what he's doing here right. <laughs> <laughs> so you had this yes we're just a pop group come buy a ticket dance, buy the t-shirt great but then these themes and what we're talking about are some of the deepest questions and subjects that humans have been wrestling with for thousands of years i assume church of england would have been big in your village um, or was your schooling give you some of that well, imagery funnily enough um andy and vince used to go to the methodist church and you know they were going there i think when the band first started this is this is probably stuff i should not be telling anyone well don't worry <laughs> <laughs> don't worry it's just a podcast <laughs> And, we just uh, edited that last part out. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I remember, um, I don't know, Andy, or I think it was, invited me along to the Methodist church one night. And uh, I, I don't know, I think I must have been like 16 or 17 or something like that. And, you know, just went along. There was like a concert on or something. And I think Vince was actually playing. And he he had an acoustic duo at the time, you know. <laughs> um, but I I don't know. There was there wasn't a lot going on in Basildon apart from like sitting in your room and learning right. song from Disco Forty Five. <laughs> so for for a short period of time, I used to go along to the uh, like the youth fellowship, like you know, occasionally, even though I didn't believe in any of it. Yeah. Um, but I found it kind of interesting, and I also found it interesting, you know, that every week they used to finish with their, um, you know, the, the, the prayers, and it was usually like, you know, prayers for people who were sick and, and dying, and then the next week they'd come back, and most of the people on the list were dead, and... <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and you were like, something about this is not working. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> so, you know, yeah, but that, that um, you know, again, it, I think it was, you know, inspiring in a way, for, uh, even for songwriting, because I think that, I think Blasphemous Rumours was kind of based on that theory, that kind of uh, experience. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Like sort of this whole thing says the thing, but it's actually I it's not working, or at least this understanding of it doesn't seem. Um, did you ever? So you're writing lyrics. Did you ever bring David some lyrics and him be like, "What the? What is? I can't <laughs> sing this." Or this is amazing. Or would you discuss? Or would or or would he just? Ah, uh, Martin, the transcendence and imminence of the corporeality that I see here with your <laughs> pro-materialism understanding of... I mean, did he... Did you have, like... What are those interactions like? Because songwriters and other bands probably aren't being like, I think you should sing this. Do you know yeah. what I mean? At that time. We, I, I don't think we've ever had uh, a real in-depth conversation about the songs. You know? <laughs> no way! <laughs> Dave always says that you know, he likes to get his own interpretations which i think is the best the greatest thing sure, about music sure. and the greatest thing about words and poetry or whatever yes. that everybody you know gets their own interpretation yes then if, if i i get asked all the time in interviews can you explain this song to me and i say no because if i tell you my mundane meaning right. of the song it's right. going to take away all of the magic that that yeah. you know so many people feel for it 
because somebody says to you, oh my word, this song got me through the hardest period of my life. What was it about? And you're like, my dog died <laughs> and there was cereal and I had my zipper stuck on my sweat. Right? Like, it, yes. I don't want to know that. <laughs> right. I always, when I've been asked this in the past, I always use this example. You know, in that bag of rock and roll records, there was Sweet Little 16 by Chuck Berry. Oh, yeah. You know, which, you know, I think he, the, the, uh, you know, Chuck Berry was even done on the, the, the man act or whatever for transporting minors across borders and stuff, you know. But <laughs> yes. in, in his book, in, in his autobiography, he said, oh, I just wrote that song because uh, my agent told me that that was the, the age group that I was appealing to. <laughs> So weird. <laughs> okay, I got a couple song questions, and then we can wrap it up. So I can ask a couple song questions. Um, it's no good. That chorus. Don't say you. I'm not yes. even gonna sing it. <laughs> when you wrote that, did, were you like washing the dishes, and all of a sudden you're like, nah, 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 nah. was that like when you come up with a hook that's that just? Fantastic. As somebody who admires a great hook. Um, does that come because you're in the studio and all of a sudden you're like, dun, 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 or are you walking the dog? I'll, I'm just going to keep humming it. <laughs> um, do you know that that works as soon as you find it? No. And I specifically remember that song. And one That's of my friends... <laughs> one of my friends will be very pleased that you asked about that one because um, there's a friend of mine called Denise De Silva who lives in Australia and I don't see her very often at all but when I wrote that song I thought that maybe it was a little on the poppy side we always have this kind of like line that we draw in the sand and you know if a song like crosses over too much then it's like oh we're not sure we've got to do if we're going to do it we're going to have to really change it you know yes. or something and I, so I was I, it wasn't I didn't think oh this is an amazing song this is a great hit I was you know, I'm not sure about it and I actually remember playing it to Denise De Silva on a guitar and she said no Martin that's it you've got to do that that that's a hit <laughs> oh really <laughs> yes because she just recognized in its most bare bones yes so you're not aware that we're going to get that thing lodged in our front temporal cortex for the next 13 years because it's so you're you're just it came out it came out somehow here it is you're not necessarily aware of what it is um no i think there's there's been a you know maybe a, a couple of times I think it, when we, when the, we've been in the studio as a band and we finished something and we may have looked at each other and thought maybe that 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 could be a hit. There's been a couple of times. <laughs> yeah, we're, in, we're English, like You're you British. said. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, well, the, the funniest one of the funniest ones I think it was uh, you know like personal Jesus, which you know we thought wouldn't get any airplay whatsoever because you know we, we we weren't sure if you could even you know in america especially say jesus on the radio <laughs> yeah so, so how did what came for what came obviously the age old question what came first with that song with the 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 title the lyrics the guitar part which is just just fantastic obviously um this is going to start sounding a little strange because... I think we passed that a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I write songs, I often don't sit down and like write a poem or, you know, complete a piece of music and then start writing words to it. I'll, I'll pick up a guitar or start playing some chords on the piano or start a bass line running on something. And I just start singing what comes naturally to me. And that's where the ideas for the songs come from. And I don't know if that's, you know, tapping into something that's, that exists somewhere or, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. But the, the songs, you know, sometimes kind of write themselves. So there's some, there's some way in which, 
it's almost like you allow your mind, the rational analyzing, standing at a distance, always taking in data, and, and the degree to which we stand outside of ourselves and go, I think I'm doing okay. Do they like me? Do they? It's almost like you, you have to sort of get in the place where that is quiet or out of the way, or the monkey mind, as some traditions say, and then you sort of just listen to what, what's, what's a layer or two below, and it comes out. Yes. And yeah. that came out. Yeah, your own personal Jesus. Yes, came out over top of a loop or a guitar part or something. Yeah, I mean the the melody is not that complicated. <laughs> <laughs> did you did you get did the band were were you like it's called Personal Jesus? Obviously, I mean did, was the band like oh yeah that work that's great, or were they like what what this time you've gone too far, Martin? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think we were. We, I, I, Obviously, we weren't thinking about it as a single straight mm -hmm. away when when the band first heard it, and I think it it got made much more uh, commercial in a good way in the studio, you know, uh, from, you know, yeah, from the from the demo, yeah. Um, but no, I don't. But I I think when we actually decided to release it as a single, we we were a little hesitant. And then you're the first person to be surprised by how how much reception it gets yeah it, all of us you know we, we we couldn't believe the uh how successful it was that is fascinating speaking of um and personal jesus is on violator correct? yes there's a song on there called policy of truth what in the world are those sounds <laughs> you know what i mean like i'm like if if someone was came from a different planet and I was explaining <laughs> the music, I'd be like, this is a guitar, this is drums, this is a harpsichord, this is a flute. But on that song, if I played them that song, I'd be like, that's like a, I don't... You mean the main riff kind of sound? The riff, the, there's like three or four parts that are sort of stacked in very tightly in the mix. Yeah. Do you... I mean, I assume there's some really subjective aesthetic thing going on where you're just like, it should sound like striking the edge of a glass bottle mixed with a... You know what I mean? In the yeah. studio, are you just, I'll know it when I hear it? I think it's it's more organic than that. It's, you know, I think part of the, the sounds that, are, that are, you're talking about are, are samples that we, you know, we, we even during Violator, we were doing quite a bit of sampling. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah it probably came from like some, uh, you know, uh, weird Asian instrument <laughs> sample CD, or or, or just a, yeah. a, or a classical Asian classical music CD with a bend in it. Gr okay, because my like our ears are we pretty much know like the palette of sounds, and I don't have a bent Asian <laughs> thing <laughs> in my database <laughs> at the moment. So I hear it, and I'm like, "What is?" Yeah, it's and then one one last question. Uh, live in Berlin. There's this just not tonight, but not tonight, but yeah. not tonight, just just but not tonight. Um, <laughs> there's this moment at the end. Where there's like a refrain. I will not sing it for you. And then the song fades. There's this gap, and then the stadium slowly, like like a wave coming towards shore, it gradually begins to form. And you hear a couple of people singing that refrain, and then more, and then more. Um, you're standing there on a stage in a stadium, and this thing that that apparently came dropped out of somewhere for you a <laughs> month or two or three or years earlier, or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You've just given people this gift. The song's over, and the the assembled mass begins to like repeat this refrain and it's like a it's it's got joy and grief in it 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 feels like everybody is you know buddhists have this thing called a resonating interval when we're all breathing at the same time it's almost like we physiologically begin to sink uh that's the obviously the power of communal s singing and laughing um where are you in that moment do you know oh this is the part where we stop, but they keep going. Are you just present in the moment? Are you like, I need my guitar for the next song? <laughs> Do you ever just go, I'm Martin Gore, and I made this noise, and this is my life, and 50,000 people are 
spontaneously taking this thing that came through my British man self. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, it, it, it is amazing. Um, virtually every night when we're on tour, we, we are extremely spoilt by our audiences. And those magical moments just happen, you know, on a regular basis. And, you know, during the set, there are probably like three or four times where they will do something like that. You know, at, uh, at the end of different songs. Yeah. And it goes on for five minutes. And Dave will usually, eventually, Dave will say something or, or clap his hands or do something to stop them. But it would actually be an interesting experiment to see how long it would go on mm -hmm. if, if we didn't actually stop them. Because the crowd would be like, we can do this all night. Yeah, I mean, that is a very European thing, by the way. Um, it, it doesn't tend to happen so much in America. Yeah, the, 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 mm. the Europeans love singing. Yeah, because you always had your local, your pub, where everybody sang and music was shared and communal. And for so many Americans, music is like for people who know how to sing or performance. Um, you perform because you're a musician as opposed to music is something we all share. Yeah, may I, I, we don't have a tradition other than, I mean, for many people, obviously a church. Otherwise, there aren't that many communal singing places as opposed to, and most people live in a suburban sprawl, so there isn't just you walk down the block and there's a collected body of songs. Yeah, well, that everybody knows. You know, in Europe, I think that um, the our audience is so fanatical and it is kind of cult-like and maybe it is even verging on church-like mm -hmm. so maybe mm -hmm. it is a bit like you know some kind of communion that goes on in those absolutely. moments absolutely yeah i always say there's something else going on here <laughs> there's something <laughs> yes. else going on here yeah there's something that connects us that flows through all of us and there are these moments when we all experience it and taste it and you'd almost see it in the room and and obviously religion is the attempt to name that, which can be very helpful and not helpful. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Fascinating. So I, if I did this and not asked you, um, there will be another Depeche Mode album? We are planning to have a meeting within the next few weeks, and we are hoping to get started in April, I believe. And do you have stuff swirling around in your head or your hard drive? Do you have overall themes and ideas or just specific little, don't say you won't. <laughs> <laughs> You're a closet singer. <laughs> <laughs> are, you looking, are you looking for a backup job? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear Lord, no. Uh, but if I'm I sure was... you could fit it into your schedule somehow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I saw Green Day and before they came out, a friend of theirs came out in a bunny outfit, drunk, <laughs> and just danced around on the stage drinking. And it absolutely, like the crowd, it like broke that, the crowd, by the time the band took the stage, the crowd was already like, let's go. <laughs> so maybe drunk bunny, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but beyond that, no. <laughs> But yeah, back to your question. Yeah, of course, I've got some songs um, finished and uh, demoed. Dave has some songs demoed. So we're, we're in a good place, ready to, to get started. Excellent. So the official word is, some men are going to have a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, I'm so glad that we could have this conversation. I, I find it so fascinating. Right. And I, I love hearing, it's always oddly inspiring to me when people... We took this turn, it went okay, this turn didn't, this was hard. <laughs> we almost gave up in America, we almost... The struggle to me is as inspiring and sacred as the, the rocket ship taking off part. Yeah. And I know I speak for so many people, what you have sung about, and uh, it's almost like finding the divine in the daily. Uh, some people go looking at a cathedral, but some people go looking in the sweat and the blood and the skin and the soil and the the everyday stuff 
And that's just oh, thank you. Really that, that was very nicely put. It's really inspired and really beautiful. So I'm looking forward to the next thing. Thank you. All right. Grace and peace, everyone. We are checking out from Martin Gore's studio. <laughs>